So good evening again and welcome to the Knoxville History Project, our history happy hour every thurs third Thursday in the month. Uh, our mission you know well and can recite it yourselves, I'm sure, to research and preserve and promote the history and culture of Knoxville, Tennessee, which we love to do. So thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Jack and uh, take it away, Jack. All right, thanks a lot, Paul, and thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, this is a, uh, an interesting subject to me. It's about a, an asset that we don't often think about. I was in, uh, I, I like to, when I can catch one, I like to ride the cat trolleys uh, back and forth from downtown to uh, UT campus. And uh, uh, three or four years ago, I was riding the trolley and I heard the robot voice, uh, which would introduce what, you know, the next uh, stop. And it said, uh, next stop, uh, World's Fair Park, Candy Factory, Sunsphere. And I thought, wow, what a, this sounds like a, like a wonderland of some sort, like, like uh, an urban version of Big Rock Candy Mountain or something. We, we don't even think about all these things. World's Fair Park, Candy Factory, Sunsphere. Uh, it, 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 uh, and and I, I got out at that stop and, uh, and, and thought it was maybe wonderful. But uh, I, I wanted to talk about this really unusual collection of architecture and other features uh, that we have in the uh, in the World's Fair Park area uh, and just uh, go through it. We're going to kind of look through it uh, sort of chronologically. Uh, we've got uh, Paul has helped a lot with putting this together and I appreciate Nicole's help as always with uh, with uh, gathering us all together. But uh, uh, we want to talk a, a little bit to begin with just about the background of what was known as the Second Creek Valley. Uh, next uh, next uh, Picture, please. Here's a, a, a well-known 1886 bird's eye view of Knoxville that many of you may have seen before. You can see the University of Tennessee in the lower left-hand uh, uh, corner. Uh, Fort Sanders was still intact on the on the right side, uh, but uh, uh, we uh, uh, were looking at the uh, area of Second Creek, which is kind of on the left side of the uh, left side of center. And Paul, you want to zoom in on the on on what we can see in, in 1886 in Knoxville. These are as accurate as they can be uh, for what they are. But this, uh, if, if you look up at the, at the uh, number one on the, uh, on the uh, left, upper left side, uh, that's the old uh, Knoxville Iron Company. Uh, and it was a very big deal. This is one of our first big industries in Knoxville after we got railroads here. Um, but we have a, a remnant of that in, in the foundry. But I, I'm just wanting to mention that this is kind of an industrial valley that had uh, had railroad connections, which you can see, it had uh, it had a creek flowing through it, uh, an open creek uh, called Second Creek. We still have that creek, but it's underground now. Um, and uh, but we we had uh, all these different factories. Uh, uh, by the way, this is called Scuffle Town in the early days. This is where the army mustered during the War of eighteen twelve, and uh, there were so many fights down there. They called it Scuffle Town and Scuffle Town Creek. Uh, but the Knoxville Iron Company was established in the 1860s. Railroad was uh, was there by the uh, 1880s, coming all the way down the valley. Uh, and uh, the first railroad to uh, uh, Cumberland Gap, for example, boarded from, from this spot. Um, but uh, it was a creek and rail line, which gave all the necessities for industry. So naturally, there are lots of large and small factories existing side by side, which had, had nothing to do with each other. They had a uh, well, the Knoxville Brewing Company was here not long after the iron uh, foundry was founded. Uh, there was a button factory, a barrel factory, a furniture factory, actually two furniture factories, a bucket factory, a tanner, a tannery, a keg factory. Uh, later on, the Tysonman Heavy Equipment Company that made earth moving and marble cutting equipment was down there. That was a major uh, factory down there but also an ice factory. Uh, back in the days when people needed to get ice from a factory, that was They've got it from from here, uh, but also finally the the candy factory. Uh, there was a candy factory. All these things, buttons and buckets and 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 barrels, uh, were all being made in the Second Creek Valley and and candy <laughs> in in a in a large scale. Uh, and we'll be talking about that more in a little bit. Uh, but the lower we have a picture of the lower uh, Second Creek Valley too. This is down near the river, and you see more factories down this way. I think that. Uh, one labeled 13 on the uh, left was the ice factory. Uh, so that was uh, that was right near Cumberland Avenue. And some uh, I've, I've heard people who actually remember that building uh, there. May, I, I don't remember noticing it, but it was still there kind of near 11th Street at Cumberland Avenue. Um, 
it's interesting that before they had that, we had to get, we shipped in ice from the Great Lakes uh, by rail uh, before the, we were actually manufacturing ice ourselves. But you can kind of see the World's Fair site down here, the, at, at this rocky crag at the end of, at the edge of Maplehurst there, which is near where the China Pavilion was. And of course, UT campus is on the, on the left of that picture. Uh, next one, please. Uh, okay, here's, uh, here's the, one of the earliest pictures we know of, of the Knoxville Iron Company. Uh, and it wasn't just one building, as you see, it was a lot of buildings, it was a complex of buildings. And the one in the middle is what we know as the foundry, uh, and it's still there today. Uh, and that, of course, of course, was the Stroh House during the, uh, the uh, World's Fair. Uh, in the foreground, you see uh, Second Creek, and that, uh, that train trestle is sort of still there today, that you, you can see the creek down below where the, the, uh, the uh, train uh, crosses it there. Uh, next one, please. <clears throat> All right, here's another uh, view of, of, the, uh, of the iron uh, company. Uh, and the Knoxville Iron Company was a big deal. And believe it or not, it's sort of still in business. Uh, it was there until about 1905 and it moved up to Lonsdale and it's now uh, the only steel mill in Tennessee. Uh, it's, uh, it, they, they make a mainly a kind of rebar, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's owned by a multinational company. And I can't remember what, the, the, what it's called. It was called CRM or something one time, but, uh, but it was down here in the valley for about uh, about 40 years and uh, and was a major employer in Knoxville in, in the e years immediately after the Civil War. But you can see the candy factory building in this picture, uh, not the candy factory, but the foundry building in this picture as well. Um, and with the, the building with little little steeple like structure uh, on it on the right. Uh, uh, next one, please. Yeah, there it is. Uh, all right, here's, a, here's another uh, picture of it uh, in the kind of a rundown condition in the 1970s. Our friend Ross Mall, who was working for the US Army when he was stationed here in Knoxville and just did some browsing around with a camera, a, a good camera, and, and took some good pictures of, uh, of downtown Knoxville and old buildings that interested in him. And of course, it was just an abandoned uh, uh, building. It says House Hassan Hardware Warehouse. House Hassan was right next door to this. Some of you may remember it uh hardware company but uh it was it looks like an abandoned uh, an abandoned building at that time uh, next one please but it got worse actually um yeah here's uh here it looks like it's just uh you know suffered from a further neglect and may, maybe an explosion or two it, it's almost like it's it's pretty shell-shocked looking in this picture uh next one and here it is just really, really forlorn. That looks like a building about to be torn down. Uh, fortunately, it was, it was not, uh, but uh, next picture. And here it is, uh, I think people are beginning to work on it. Uh, some people, it, it, takes, it takes some ima imagination to look at a building like that and, say, and see maybe this has potential. But that happened when people started talking about the World's Fair and they began fixing it up. Uh, next picture, please. All right, here it is uh, as the Stroh House. It's ready for business, and uh, and and a lot of you remember the Stroh House and all the all the fun that happened there. I don't know who the architect of this building was. It was uh, it's going to be hard to discern that. Uh, the guy that put the uh, ice the uh, Iron Company together uh, was a guy named Hiram S. Chamberlain, and he may have played a role because he had a, a sense of design. We did we did a a, a book about the National Cemetery, which is less than a mile a, a half a mile from here. Uh, and uh, Hiram Chamberlain was Gerald Burnside's quartermaster uh, during the Civil War. He was from Ohio. He came here during the war, uh, like Knoxville, and stuck around. Uh, but he, he's the guy that uh, was in charge of the Knoxville Iron Company at, at some point when they were building this, these buildings. And he's the guy, we think, the guy that decided how to lay out the National Cemetery, the National Cemetery in that unusual concentric circle design that it has that everybody notices. But uh, uh, anyway, it's, it's amazing, the National Cemetery, which looks always brand new. Uh, it's bright green grass and bright white stones to this day, but it looks exactly, it's the same, it's a Civil War relic. It's the same cemetery that was established by Hiram Chamberlain, who also owned this, this company in, uh, in 1863. Uh, next one. Uh, you're right, the Steel Company, that is a uh, connection to the Gar Gerdau, and I don't know if that's their current name or not. They've been bought and sold some in, in recent, recent years. But here's, uh, here's another picture of the Stroh House during the fair. It was a lively, lively place. I remember hearing, being at a station in crowd control and hearing that Jerry Lee Lewis had showed up there unexpectedly unannounced 
and began banging away on the piano at the Stroh House. And I, I said, gosh, I wish I could be there. But, uh, but it, it, was, uh, it was fun all, it, uh, you know, 12 hours a day, it was a fun place to be. Uh, next one, please. Here's inside and we the, the way this picture is shot is, is, kind of, is kind of ominous, isn't it? You are a stranger here. But I think, uh, I think it was uh, the full uh, motto said, you are a stranger here only once or something to that effect. Uh, but here's a, uh, one of the very few pictures we have of a typical interior at the, uh, at the Stroh House. And we, we've gotten a whole lot, we've gotten more than a thousand uh, donated pictures through our uh, Paul's campaign to collect pictures, but very few interior shots. People tend to take pictures of the outsides of buildings which don't change, and it's really the, in, the interiors are, are often what's interesting to look at. Um, the outsides do change some, so those pictures do have value. But um, but this uh, we we have very few interior pictures of any buildings at the, during the World's Fair. Uh, next one, please. All right, here is uh, the Energy Saving House, one of the uh, the uh, uh, Victorian uh, buildings that were saved for the fair. Uh, these were, there were a, a cluster of these buildings over on the edge of the fair site, uh, seven uh, 1890s roughly buildings uh, that were all clustered together. Uh, there were, um, and, and they were, they were kind of fascinating. There, there are four kind of good sized typical family home buildings, not large mansions, but just typical family home buildings and three smaller buildings that are kind of, uh, kind of tied together. But this tells you something about what made the World's Fair remarkable. Uh, there has never been a more, uh, it's been said that there's never been a more preservationist fair. They saved, I think, 12 buildings in all uh, for use in the fair. This is a picture taken just yesterday that I, I took yesterday of the three uh, very small Victorian buildings facing 11th Street. These buildings were in such disrepair in 1979. I lived around the corner at the time. That they said they're going to tear them down and they were really interesting to me because they were so small they were they were had victorian pretension but they were very small and they, at that time they were covered with vines and uh, and i i thought well they're, they're very poignant looking i came down here with a camera and took a bunch of pictures and i wish i could find those pictures uh they, they're somewhere but uh but i i took the i took the pictures because i thought they're going to be torn down and I, I found out just a few months later that no they're going to be fixed up and used in the uh in in the fair uh, so this was a, a, an interesting command decision by the fair planners to save so much of these these buildings. That doesn't usually happen at World's Fairs. World's Fairs usually, usually erase everything and build anew. Uh, even the Spokane Fair, I think they saved like one tower from a train station or something like that. But uh, before they cleared the ground for the fair, uh, but it was. Uh, but we've had all the all twelve of these buildings. I think eleven of the twelve buildings are still standing today. So it's uh, we we done a had a pretty good record with this. And preservation was new at the time. Preservation uh, Knox Heritage was only eight years old. Uh, we'd only saved the Bijou back in seventy four, and it was kind of a. Some people thought that was a crazy crackpot thing to do, but uh, but this was the beginning. I think of a of a sense of preservation in Knoxville, and I think the World's Fair uh, kind of demonstrated not only to Knoxville but to the world who came that. Look, old buildings have have value. These buildings had just small. Each one had a, a small, different feature. One of them was the uh, Budweiser beer garden, uh, the one down closest to the Clydesdales, uh, farthest in this from from this perspective. But uh, but that was a fun place to a fun place to be. They had a kind of a back porch uh, beer garden. Uh, next one, please. Uh, but uh, by the way, uh, who was it that said? Uh, um, uh, uh, Gene Burr, uh, was in, who's, who may be here tonight, uh, was involved in this. Gene Burr was also involved in the Old City Project, which was just beginning at this time. People forget the Old City was unknown to most people in 1982. It wasn't until 1983 that Annie's opened the very first uh, rest, you know, modern era restaurant down there. Uh, and uh, but uh, but a, a certain number of, uh, of, of enlightened uh, preservationists, preservationists, including Gene Burr, who worked on these houses with the fair, were also working at the uh, at the uh, on the old city project. Um, I, I once did a uh, research on all the people who lived in all these buildings. There were uh, there were a lot of ministers uh, in, in those days. Uh, uh, church ministers often didn't make very much money, so they didn't have mo enough money for. A house on Laurel Avenue or Clinch Avenue, but just a, these smaller houses on 11th Street. Um, but uh, but the uh, 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 Charles Smith, who was one of the the, the fair's uh, chief uh, architects, uh, was uh, was uh, promised that the 1982 World's Fair would, would be the most recyclable 
fair in history because of the buildings we were saving and that they would all be saved and used for different purposes in the future. And he was he was right about that. Uh, next one, please. All right, and here's an example. This is the LNN station. Uh, the uh, this is built to be a, a passenger train station in 1905. I've learned a lot about this that I did not know. The building uh, architect is not on record in public records, but it's been uh, very uh, credibly attributed to a guy named Richard Montfort, uh, who lived in Louisville, Kentucky at the time. But he was born in Ireland in 1854. Um, he studied at the Royal College of Science at Dublin. And uh, he, he, he uh, worked for LNN and made his living uh, designing things for LNN, especially train stations. He also designed the famous Union Station in, in Nashville, which has also been uh, well, uh, well uh, 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 renovated and reused. Uh, in 1905, he had a mandate uh, from, uh, from LNN to build a station that was uh, more impressively eye-catching than the uh, fairly new Southern Station just around the corner. Uh, the Southern Railway was a much bigger railway and went at much farther distances, but they were going to build, they went at the LNN station, even though it was mainly for short distances from here to Cincinnati or Atlanta uh, or Louisville, it was mainly for short distances, but they wanted a fancier station. So, uh, so he began uh, with this design that has been described uh, often with different versions of the word chateau, chateau-esque uh, or chateau-like. Uh, building, but, it, but it, it's a, it's described as a Flemish Renaissance style, and I was not all that familiar with that, but I began looking this up uh, to find out what Flemish Renaissance was, and it's very much like that. The, those elaborate gables look like, they look like furniture on the uh, outside is, is, is uh, typical of, of Flemish Renaissance, uh, but a, a beautiful station, 1905 built that had uh, all the, it was, of course, segregated, had, had, uh, had uh, rooms for black and white, uh, 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 passengers uh, and had uh, had a few features we'll see uh, pictures of in a minute uh, but of course this is the corner of uh, of Henley and uh, and what was then Asylum Street but uh, is, is now known as, as Western or Summit Hill um, so uh, next one please Paul uh, yeah I talked about the film Flemish Renaissance style we uh, Paul came up with this uh, with this picture of a, a, a postcard from the 1878 World's Fair, and it seemed appropriate to, to use this as, a, as an example of Flemish Renaissance, since it was another another World's Fair. The Belgian Pavilion at the World's Fair had a Flemish Renaissance uh, uh, pavilion. The 1878 fair, by the way, was the one that Knox, Knoxville's own may, former mayor, Peter Staub, went there as the U.S. Commissioner uh, representing the United States at the 1878 World's Fair, which was famous for the, uh, the American part was famous for having Edison and Bell there and also for showing off the uh, what the the uh, was it the head or the torch of the uh, Statue of Liberty at that at that fair before it was shipped over to over to America. Um, next one, please. And here's another one we just found. I thought it'd be interesting to show because it does look kind of like the uh, LNN station, the Paps Mansion in Milwaukee. It's a few years older than the LNN station, but has that same kind of elaborate. Uh, uh, gable uh, treatment with that really uh, kind of flourish real cocoa sort almost uh, gable treatment that uh, is uh, is typical of the, the Flemish Renaissance style. Uh, next one, please. All right, this is inside the LNN, and I wish you were still there. This looks like a fun uh, a fun place, the Crescent News Lunchroom uh, at, at Room with Two O's. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a uh, uh, those ladies look look uh, ready for you. Uh, no matter what you want, they're really elaborate coffee makers back there, and some uh, and some uh, various other kinds of soft drinks behind the behind the counter. But it's uh, it's uh, uh, I, I doubt that the 1878 Belgian Pavilion still exists. To answer that question, uh, I don't know for sure. But uh, uh, usually, that's the interesting thing about a lot of World's Fairs: just tear down everything after it's over, and sometimes they're meant to be per, uh, temporary, and they just ship them off. But uh, often pieces get saved, but um, but anyway, this uh, there was a uh, I, I love the fact that the, uh, a newsstand would have a have a lunchroom, a place where you could buy a newspaper and sit down and and have a cup of coffee and read the newspaper, and that's what people with a layover at the uh, L and N would do. Uh, next one, please. All right, here's another exterior picture from the uh, from the uh, what the interior side of the block, uh, looking back at the uh, at the state at the station building. 
uh, and you see the train car that says Louisville and Nashville. That's what the LNN was. Next one. Another another shot of the uh, train station. The last train that left here was in 18, nine, uh, nine, I'm sorry, 1968. So it was a, an operating passenger station for a total of 63 years. I remember coming here as a kid and riding the, uh, uh, getting a ride on the General down to Maribel. Uh, they had the, the Civil War engine actually was still running and they, they added in Knoxville for a while. And, and, and during the centennial, they were uh, taking a, a excursion trips down to Maribel and back. But uh, next one. All right, here's a here's a, a nice, uh, a lovely uh, World's Fair era picture of this renovated train station, and I'm really glad. Who knows what would have happened? It had been empty for 14 years at the time of the World's Fair. Who knows what would have happened to it? Uh, but it was it, it was saved, uh, and it was saved uh, during the fair for a couple of restaurants in there. I know that Ruby Tuesdays had a restaurant, and there was the later on was the L and Fish Market. There were two or three or four restaurants over the years and been it right remained a restaurant space and of course now uh, what about 10 years ago was renovated very well renovated thoroughly renovated I think it looks better now uh, that uh, that uh, uh, the uh, uh, LNN STEM Academy is uh, is there it was it, it looks probably better as, as good or better now than it did in 1905 when it was built it's it's uh, and I wish more people could see the inside you have to wait for a special event to to welcome the public in there, but it's uh, it's it's very well done. There, uh, but they're kind of careful. They uh, the public doesn't isn't allowed very close to the building right now, when especially when kids are there. Uh, next one. But uh, yeah, here's from the behind, and uh, of course during the fair it was uh, it was very well used. People walked up and down the old steps just like passengers did for many for many years, um, and. Uh, by the way, this station was uh, famous in the uh, in the work of uh, James Agee. Um, the uh, I remember the they the said the uh, LNN station was was uh, was uh, uh, was smoldering like an exhausted butterfly. That's uh, one of my favorite descriptions of it. Uh, in the famous uh, lifesaver walk from uh, when he and his his doomed father are are walking down Asylum Avenue to their home in, in Fort Sanders. They they pause and and remark about it, but that the station actually returns several times in the in the uh, in the course of the novel. Uh, so it's one of the most literary uh, spaces here. Also, the stained glass is described in there, and there's a stained glass uh, throughout the, uh, the 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 train station. But um, anyway, next one, please. All right, across the street, uh, a lot of people don't remember this, uh, but across the street was uh, the L N N Hotel. It was not nearly as elaborate as the train station. It was a very simple uh, three-story building, uh, but it was, uh, I remember it was, a, it was a restaurant. It was kind of unusual. It was a restaurant in my memory that you would park in the back and enter through the, on, through the third floor uh, and then walk down into the uh, hotel. And it was renovated. Uh, I, I think Gene Burr was involved in this as well, renovated for the use of the World's Fair because uh, this was where the, uh, behind it was where the Folk Life Festival was. And that's where so many, uh, great uh, country and blues musicians, uh, 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 Doyle Lawson and 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 uh, 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 Howard Armstrong and all these folks, these legends today, were performing outside mainly uh, in the uh, Folk Life Festival. But people would go from the hotel to the festival part, uh, hotel which is a restaurant to the festival part, and and just to enjoy this kind of unusual and you kind of enjoy the. Also, the uh, the difference is in elevation in Knoxville that you see that everybody remarks about. I, I met a guy from New York today and just amazed at how hilly Knoxville was and how all these buildings are built on the sides of hills, and uh, and you can see that all over all over the edge of downtown. But uh, yeah, yeah, some I remember the spiders and butterflies. That was uh, it was kind of an Asian themed restaurant and had some had some interesting uh, uh, interesting treats uh, that you don't see many other places. Uh, next one. All right, yeah, here's the uh, the the hotel uh, from uh, a perspective. I I think it's from the back, uh, but the uh, old Smoky Lounge, Ellen and Hotel Restaurant Lounge. That was uh, this was during the fair, and uh, and it was open as a restaurant before the fair, but wasn't uh, wasn't this elaborate or this busy? I don't think ever in my in my memory. Uh, next one. 
All right, here's the viaduct. Uh, this was built about the same time as the Illinois station was. Uh, and they, uh, they needed a, a bigger viaduct than they'd had before, uh, built it in 1905. And the uh, uh, Mayor Gass's uh, five-year-old daughter uh, inaugurated it by, by, ride, uh, by driving a, a, a horse cart across, across the, uh, the, uh, the viaduct with, with supervision, of course. Uh, this this is a postcard and it's it's puzzling to look at because we think uh, uh, some of the skyline was filled in with buildings that may have just existed in the artist's imagination. Uh, we think this is looking toward downtown uh, from the Fort Sanders side, but uh, but it's a, it's a it's an interesting interesting uh, postcard. This uh, platform uh, was was still there in at the time of the World's Fair. It was later replaced with a new one, but the old piers are still uh, the original piers uh, that you see uh, today under the, uh, the, the current platform of the, uh, of the Clinch Viaduct. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, and here it is during the fair uh, in a, a very busy place. Uh, I, I don't remember those big uh, tents on, on top, uh, but it was, uh, it was a, a good place to kind of survey the fair uh, and lots of stuff going on. I think there's stuff being sold in those uh, in structures on the top of the viaduct. And uh, it was uh, it remained pedestrian only for a long time after the fair. Um, and, uh, and, and there were other events there. I went to a, 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 a literary festival there a few years after the fair on that viaduct. Uh, next one, please. All right. Littlefield and Steer uh, is, uh, is the only thing on the ferry site between the L&N and, uh, and the, uh, 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 the Sun Sphere and the World's Fair stuff. Uh, this picture was taken in the 1920s, but the building was built in 1916. Uh, Littlefield and Steer was a candy factory. Uh, and uh, they began in the 1890s downtown on Jackson Avenue at a time when there were about seven or eight different candy manufacturers in Knoxville, but they became much bigger than all the others and eventually had a, a nationwide market. They made everything from marshmallows to bonbons, little chocolates, all sorts of things. Uh, but they, uh, they shipped uh, candy all over America and they even had some market in, in Cuba and overseas, I think. Uh, it was, uh, they, they were very successful for quite a few years. Uh, they went out of business in 1933. I'm sure the depression didn't help, but a lot of the families had had uh, unexpected deaths. The Littlefield and Steer, I think, had both died just uh, rather suddenly before uh, that period, uh, and uh, they they end up just uh, selling out, and uh, and the building was empty for a while. They tried to retrofit it as a beer brewery in the 1930s. That was one of the saving graces of the Depression. That in 1933, suddenly alcohol was legal legal again, and in Knoxville, we there were a couple of different efforts to start a brewery here. None of them ever worked out. Uh, but this eventually was just used as a warehouse for many years by uh, Millers, I believe. But here's some Millers, uh, here's some, some Littlefield and Steer uh, uh, products. Uh, Smoky Mountain Dew is kind of funny to see that a delicious con confection. Uh, uh, but Smoky Mountain, Mountain Dew was, uh, of course, an old, before the, this is long before the soft drink of the same name. Uh, Mountain Dew is an old, uh, an old mountain word for, for moonshine. Uh, so that was uh, kind of a, 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 a a subtle joke, I guess, with that uh, name of the candy. Um, but uh, that's the, uh, their original uh, location was, uh, you know, well, yeah, here's Clinch and Second Street. Second Street was what they called uh, 10th Street, uh, which doesn't exist anymore, but was just, uh, is now where World's Fair Park Drive, World's Fair Drive is now. Uh, Second Street was named that because the street numbering was originally for West Knoxville, which was where Fort Sanders is. So all the streets were numbered one through uh, 12 or something like that. And after uh, West Knoxville was uh, incorporated into Knoxville, they realized that didn't make any sense anymore. So they began numbering it based on its distance from the axis of Central Avenue or Central Street downtown. So uh, the uh, 1100s would be on 11th Street and so forth. So that's why that says, uh, corner clinch in second street and, and as it was in in 1916. Uh, next one please. Yeah here's uh, here's the candy factory as it's being uh, seen uh, as, during her renovations for the for the fair. Um, and this is the uh, this is the tall side. This is the what uh, seven story side of the candy factory uh, the elevation 
the eastern elevation is it looks like a taller building than the uh, western elevation does. Uh, next one, please. And here it is during the fair when it was all all uh, all happy and festive. Uh, if you look carefully, that uh, Miller at Miller's Beer Lookout that we had uh, Stroh's was the big beer at the fair in the Stroh House, but and Budweiser had their Clydesdale here. Clydesdale's here, but Miller wanted to get on the action too, and Miller had their the Miller Lookout, which was the balcony where you could drink Miller beer and look down at the fair uh, site. But uh, it's a great old building. I'm really glad that we saved it, uh, and it's obviously useful today. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, here it is today. This picture was taken yesterday, and uh, this is the uh, shorter elevation, the five-story elevation on the uh, on the uh, uh, west side of the building. And this is where you enter to go with the people who live in the condos. This is where they enter. And there, uh, there was for many years a chocolate factory on the on the ground floor, which kind of echoed the old candy factory purpose. And today, it's a uh, uh, they they were there till about five years ago, and and finally left. Uh, and uh, and now it's uh, now it's a comic book store, uh, but uh, but it's still a, a pretty uh, a pretty ritzy condo uh, place. Then this was what they announced was going to happen to this. Uh, after the fair in 1982, uh, but it didn't work out. Nobody was interested in doing it in 1983 or four uh, for a while. So they made it uh, for a while in an art center and it was much beloved and used for that purpose for about 15 years. The final when so much art stuff moved downtown, it became it became the, uh, uh, the condo building it is today and a very, a very valuable piece of property too. But, uh, uh, and here's here's uh, the back yesterday. Not a great picture, I, and I can say that because I, I took it. But it's uh, but I just want to show there are people actually eating supper on the on the back porches here in this area that was kind of built in uh, in this what had been kind of a uh, recessed area in the original building. Now has this modern uh, uh, part that's built in, and people are really enjoying their their lives there. You can tell because almost all those porches have furniture on them, even when they don't have people on them. Um, next one. All right, here's the uh, the famous uh, Sun Sphere, uh, and uh, it's uh, this was uh, uh, designed by a, uh, a company called Community Tectonics, um, and uh, you often just see their name, and that's all there is to it. Uh, hexag hexagonal uh, truss structure, 266 feet tall. Uh, the uh, it, the globe is meant to represent the sun, the source of all energy on the planet, uh, and uh, it's uh, it glows yellow like the sun, but with with gold in the glass, gold inlaid in the glass. It's a, it's an interesting idea. Uh, whether people make fun of it or not, it, it was a, it was a, an interesting combination of ideas that that uh, they came together to, uh, to make this the uh, theme structure of the 1982 World Fair. But uh, the guy that designed it uh, was not named Community Tectonics. It was a guy that started that company uh, back in the 50s. Uh, he lived in Gatlinburg, but he had been born in uh, Illinois. His name was uh, was was Hubert Beth. Uh, he worked with a couple of his colleagues uh, to build to design the Sun Sphere, Donald Shell and Bill Denton, uh, on the the Sun Sphere. But this is uh, Mr. Bebb himself uh, uh, died not long after the fair, but and was an older man at the time. But he was uh, already kind of well known in in the area. He'd done a lot of work. He he loved the mountains. He would like I say was from Illinois, but uh, but came to uh, this area because he loved the Smoky Mountains and lived in in Gatlinburg. Uh, and that's where he started his, his company. Uh, but he designed a, a very famous piece of work in the mountains before this, uh, 1955, uh, the uh, out the uh, big uh, uh, tower at Clingman's Dome. And we have, a, I think we have, a, there it is. That's an early, uh, early Hubert Bebb uh, structure. It was controversial at the time, I guess maybe still controversial to some people, very modernist piece of work in the middle of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, but uh, but he was uh, he was the same guy who later uh, who later designed the Sun Sphere you know, almost 30 years later. Um, but uh, but he was uh, interesting because he's a connection to an earlier World Sphere. Uh, it, it's interesting you don't see any connections to Knoxville mentioned. I've not found any in promotions of the World Sphere. Uh, people thought it was just crazy that Knoxville should have a World Sphere, uh, and because even though Knoxville had many connections to other World Spheres before, but but only in the late 19th and early 20th century. But Hubert Bebb was a guy living here who had been a designer at the Chicago World Sphere of 1933, 49 years before the 1982 World Sphere. This is uh, this is just a, a shot of the uh, 
Chicago Fair of 33. And uh, Hubert Bebb was one of several designers who did uh, who did work on on that uh, that yeah famous World's Fair. Uh, but uh, yeah, a lot of uh, would love to have seen uh, have seen some of this to connect the the Paps thing. The Paps Blue Ribbon Casino was there, uh, but the uh, that uh, Paps keep Paps and other beers keep coming up in the dock tonight. But uh, anyway, and the Mueller Paps Cafe over there. But uh, yeah, beer, you can't have a World's Fair without some beer. I think that's the uh, general message of, of this. Um, but uh, anyway, it's uh, uh, an interesting uh, journey that Hubert Bebb took from the 1933 Chicago World's Fair to the 1982 Nostal World's Fair uh, and, uh, and brought some maybe some interesting ideas with him. By the way, he, uh, uh, he and the, the other architects, uh, uh, including Mr. Denton, uh, uh, worked, uh, consulted with a very famous architect on the Sun Sphere, a guy named Buckminster Fuller. Uh, and he had uh, other Knoxville connections before this. He was, of course, the creator of the geodesic dome, which became famous at the Montreal World's Fair of 1967, uh, and, and which is still there. Um, but uh, he has a, an interesting connection because he was in Knoxville lecturing at UT when they were unveiling the uh, geodesic dome in Montreal. And the uh, national press was interviewing him in Knoxville about the geodesic dome in Montreal while he, while he was here. Uh, but uh, anyway, he was a, an interesting guy. And by the way, that geodesic dome in Montreal was eventually uh, covered with Roman Haas plexiglass. Uh, so that was uh, uh, an interesting thing for, from uh, manufactured nozzle, you know, thousands of pieces of it. Um, but the, uh, the, the Sun Sphere has uh, some aspects that look like a geodesic dome sort of. And we don't know whether his advice had anything to do with the final uh, appearance of the Sun Sphere or not, but he came here and and uh, consulted with uh, some architects. Had they actually had uh, had a uh, dinner at the uh, Club Le Conte, uh in downtown and and talked about World's Fair architecture, uh, which uh, he was one of the kind of, I guess one of the world authorities on the subject. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, here's a Sun Sphere under construction, and I, I I lived near there at the time, and I, I really thought it was a beautiful building. I liked it as it was being built, and I was not that crazy about when they started filling it in with uh, with yellow glass, but uh, I thought it really it was an inter interesting structure when it was first uh, being built. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, here it is, just a little bit farther along. Uh, next one, and uh, and completed. Um, the uh, Sun Sphere has uh, been through quite a lot uh, culturally and, and otherwise. Uh, it's uh, it, it's uh, uh, by the way, it's one of uh, one of only three World's Fair towers in America. Uh, the others are uh, the Space Needle in Seattle, not the one in Gatlinburg, uh, but uh, this, the Space Needle in Seattle, and the uh, Tower of the Americas in San Antonio. And I've been up in that one. That's the tallest of the three. And this is the is the shortest, but it's it, the other two don't have are, are pretty are pretty spare and basic and as towers, and this uh, one has this real, really extraordinarily unusual uh, uh, feature to it: the, the giant uh, 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 golden globe, uh, which was claimed to be the only the most perfectly spherical building in the world at the time. I don't know how you you judge that, but that was that was the claim, and I can't argue with it. But it's been through quite a lot over the years. It's been uh, it's been uh, uh, made fun of. It's been shot at. Uh, uh, Miss USA stood on top of the Sun Sphere to welcome the world to the television broadcast when Bob Barker was here for the Miss USA pa pageant of 1983. So this was they had this uh, helicopter shot of this woman standing alone on top of the Sun Sphere, uh, greeting the world, uh, welcoming the world to Knoxville. In 1983, and then showing, pointing over to the Civic Coliseum, which is where they had the, the pageant, and uh, had all the dancing and all everything else was going on there. Uh, but it was, uh, uh, it, it's kind of a, it's on YouTube if you want to see it. It's kind of an amazing, amazing thing to uh, behold. But also, it's uh, been made fun of in the uh, in the Simpsons uh, uh, cartoon. Uh, this is, of course, you you may have seen this uh, this uh, interesting episode uh, that uh, was not entirely complimentary to Knoxville, but it's still fun to uh, to watch. Uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, of course, there was one uh, one kid, Nelson, threw a rock at it, and, it, and the uh, Sun Sun Sphere, which was a wig sh wig shop, uh, uh, fell over. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, it was uh, um, 
kind of a kind of an interesting it, it was the kind of embarrassing thing that we're kind of proud of that we people like to watch that uh, that Simpsons episode it has been mocked as a disco ball or a golf ball on a tee but it's also been imitated and this is remarkable I don't know if you, you've seen this picture before uh, but in Kazakhstan uh, over a, a former part of the Soviet Union there's this this was built a few years after the sun sphere and believe it or not, this was central to an energy world's fair a few years ago. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's uh, it, it, nothing's new under the sun sphere, so to speak. But uh, but in in Kazakhstan, that doesn't represent the sun. That represents the uh, egg of a giant uh, uh, mythical bird. Uh, I forgot what it's called, but that it's uh, this is that structure around it is the nest of this mythical bird. Uh, so. Uh, it's, it's a way to say this is not the sun sphere. It's a it's an egg in a nest. How do you see the sun sphere? But uh, anyway, it's a it's in a, the the uh, city that used to be called Astana, but I think it's been called Nur Sultan for the current ruler of uh, of Kazakhstan. Uh, it may have another name next year. We don't know, but uh, but it's a fascinating thing, and I, I can't imagine that that's even uh, that that's even uh, uh, even anybody could could even claim that that's not uh, a borrowed idea from from Knoxville. Um, next one, please. All right, uh, less uh, more interesting than the, the sun sphere to many uh, architects is this building. This is the building that was kind of mocked as the uh, as the as as Dolly's bra in 1982. That's what people called it, uh, kind of routinely, uh, and that was funny enough. But it was uh, uh, but it, it's actually a a a, a, a groundbreaking, uh, uh, almost revolutionary. Uh, piece of architecture uh, designed by, attributed to a guy named Horst Berger, who was born in 1828, uh, was a student at, at Stuttgart. I guess he grew up in Nazi Germany, but he was, uh, he was a kid at that time. Uh, but he was uh, studied at Stuttgart in the early uh, 1950s uh, architecture and began experimenting with uh, tensile fabric design, a very modern design of, uh, of, of uh, adaptable to lots of purposes. Um, this, uh, the uh, Tennessee Amphitheater, of course, served as a, as a major performance space uh, during the World's Fair. It's where the uh, daily uh, performances of Sing Tennessee, which is kind of a Broadway style show, uh, was, um, uh, do, do we have any picture, pictures of the, uh, of the uh, amphitheater itself, Paul, or is that, uh, just wanted to just go back to that one? Uh, but this was where uh, uh, lots and lots of performers, interesting performers, were. Uh, Lamar Alexander played piano with the KSO there. Um, it, it, lots of, and the Warsaw Philharmonic was there during the Solidarity Movement, and they, it was an emotional night that night because there was a demonstration going on in favor of Polish sol solidarity here in Knoxville. So it was uh, it was it was uh, lots of uh, fascinating uh, connections. But Horst Ber Berger, who was a who was a, not an architect exactly, but an architectural engineer. Uh, worked with uh, Bruce McCarty, uh, the uh, the uh, local uh, advocate of modernism, champion of modernism in town, and uh, uh, were, they had a lot of respect for each other. And and uh, Horsberger designed this thing uh, as a as a as a useful uh, uh, a useful building. It's it's great because it has a uh, you can walk in as an audience member, but you can walk uh, past it as I did last night with the UT non credit group over the top of it, uh, over, over the back of it, not, and not really even go into the theater itself. You can see it, but not actually go into it and just walk all the way through and to the other side. Uh, so it's, a, it's an, an adaptable, interesting uh, building uh, that uh, I'm glad we saved. It was almost torn down about 20 years ago because a lot of the original uh, steel structures were, uh, were corroding pretty badly and is becoming unsafe, but this, the city with Bruce McCarty, who was a very old man at the time, was became a champion of saving this building, and uh, and successfully did so. Uh, and uh, I'm I'm glad that we're grateful to him. He died a few years ago, but he was very proud that Knoxville had this building. And and polls of architects have said this is one of the most uh, important buildings in in Tennessee, uh, just for its uh, role in the uh, in the early years of this tensile fabric design. And we have a few other examples of uh, of. of, of of Horsberger's uh, career. This is the Denver International Airport. Does this look familiar? This is built a few years after the Sun Sphere. And look at all the, uh, it looks like it has a bunch of Tennessee amphitheaters on top of it. Uh, next one, please. And here's uh, the King Fahd International Stadium in Saudi Arabia, uh, also a Horsberger uh, design. 
Uh, next one. And uh, another one at, at Jeddah, the uh, uh, King Abdulaziz International Airport um, in Jeddah. Uh, next one. And okay, here's uh, here's a building that I'm, I'm sorry to say uh, is is not here anymore. Uh, the U.S. Pavilion. This was meant to be a permanent building, uh, but but uh, was not. It's hard to even tell this actually a building, but it was a six-story building uh, built there and designed by an Atlanta uh, firm that uh, known uh, for short as Fabrap. That, that stood for Finch, Alexander, Barnes, Rothschild, and Pascal. Uh, they were a firm around that uh, from 1958 to 1984. Uh, that did a lot of design, but like the Coke, uh, Coca-Cola in headquarters in Atlanta, uh, several kind of uh, well-known uh, uh, Georgia buildings. Uh, this actually won a, uh, a architectural prize from from a Georgia State uh, architectural prize, uh, if if not one in Tennessee. Uh, but it didn't. Uh, it didn't. Not everybody liked it. Uh, the New Yorker uh, uh, writer and critic E.J. Kahn came here and described it as a slope side six story pile whose main distinction is that it is in part solar hearted solar heated and solar cooled looks like a factory that has been designed by the factory's owner's son in law <laughs> um, he didn't he didn't like the building rex reed remember rex reed the uh, the kind of celebrity critic uh, came here and described it as a as a six level horror of glass and steel that looks like a giant gas works gone berserk. Uh, it also had, and we, we've been kind of frustrated not to see good pictures of it. It also had connected to it in a separate building, an IMAX theater. Um, and uh, this was, uh, uh, it was right behind the, the, uh, the main uh, pavilion. And you can kind of, you can see the entrance to the IMAX theater from there. Um, uh, this was, uh, this is all, all built together and they were both meant to be permanent, uh, but, and the city tried to use this building for several things. I think there was an art auction in there once, and they had uh, chili cook-offs and and very some religious events and some er, 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 several things. Ironically, one of the reasons the city wanted to get rid of it was that it was not it was energy inefficient. That it was uh, it was a uh, uh, it was it was expensive to to keep up, which is uh, it's, it's it's kind of a, kind of not what was intended. I think uh, for that. Uh, but there was a, uh, it was finally demolished in 1991 uh, at uh, big spectacular dynamite explosions that destroyed both buildings nine years after the fair. And I, have to, I remember the groaning that happened when the city, uh, the city had in the 90s was going through a lot of hiring a lot of uh, consultants to advise on different things. I remember one consultant saying what downtown needed, how do we get people back downtown? And one consultant was here and he studied the issue and said, you know what downtown really needs? is an IMAX theater. And this was about five years after we'd torn down the one that we had. Uh, and there was some groaning in the room at the time, um, which he probably didn't understand. Um, but uh, anyway, it's uh, uh, it's not there anymore. It's kind of, you can kind of see where it was though. It's kind of the, at the very end of the, uh, uh, the, of the of the water where the waterfall is. And that's where the, the US Pavilion was. Uh, but it was kind of a symbol of America. This was where they had all the high tech stuff. This is where the touch screen computers were. Most people had never seen anything like this. And even Rex Reed came there and were just amazed. He was uh, that you could touch a screen and it would change. Uh, that most people had never seen that. And he, he tried to get somebody to explain it to him. And he said he couldn't find anybody that understood it either in, in the even working for the pavilion. Um, but uh, you know, it's uh, it was, a lot of interesting stuff was unveiled here, whether people knew what it was at the time or not. I think people at the time we thought, you know, what's a touchscreen computer for? But we actually use the same technology on our smartphones today. Um, but uh, next one, please. All right, here's uh, the first thing built after the fair was the National Museum of Art, uh, and uh, it was uh, designed by uh, I think one of the ten or so best art known architects to work in in Knoxville, Edward Larrabee Barnes, uh, who was uh, a well known architect, died several years ago. Uh, did uh, was best, well known for art museums and kind of big uh, you know, monumental monumental structures. Uh, here he made a choice of using pink Tennessee marble, uh, which uh, is a, that's an architect's choice often, but to, to evoke uh, the local stuff. I don't know if we have a good picture with. Uh, if we go back. Uh, yeah, here, here's some of his other his other works at Wichita Museum of Art, and um, uh, we have another one or. Uh, 
if we can go back to the uh, yeah, pink Tennessee marble, he used this on uh, to, uh, uh, to to put on the outside of the uh, the uh, KMA uh, to kind of because Tennessee marble has been used for art and architecture here since the 1790s. Uh, the first use known uh, to history was Ramsey House, uh, which is still there, the historic house, 1797 house. Uh, but here's the, here's the uh, the building under construction in 1990. Uh, and uh, uh, was, uh, was 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 I think it's been a successful building. And it's uh, uh, we love the KMA, and they have a, a, if you haven't seen their uh, their higher ground exhibit, it's a great uh, chronological story of art, basically with the actual art uh, uh, since the 1850s to the present time. Um, but uh, and, and the impressionism of of Catherine Wiley and the abstract work of of uh, Buford Delaney. Um, but uh, but here it is uh, when they still had the old uh, uh, quarter flags in in front. Remember the the old quarter flags, the long linear quarter flags uh, was still there. There and 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 uh, it was kind of uh, awkward after the fair. It was not uh, all that uh, uh, all that functional, and we we kind of uh, worked on that that idea. By the way, I don't know if it was meant to be symbolic, but this was uh, was cited. At the uh, on the side of the Japan Japan Pavilion, which was most famous for its painting robot, so it, it had an artistic robot at the future site of the uh, Nassau Museum of Art. Um, uh, next one, please. Yeah, here's the opening of it. Um, dramatic, very dramatic, uh, artsy opening. Uh, next one. All right, here's a, here's a picture from the Nassau Museum of Art looking over at these other buildings that were built at the same time as the World's Fair, for the World's Fair. Uh, the black building uh, was what the World's Fair Holiday Inn uh, was right on the World's Fair site. And uh, the, the white building was the kind of the World's Fair administration office building. It's where they had a lot of the, the press met and they, they met with uh, you know various uh, officials and so forth there during the fair and offered a good view of the fair. Uh, that was uh, a state office building for many years after the fair. It was re finally refitted, I think, in 1986 to be a state office building. Uh, and now uh, these are two uh, hotels. Uh, the black one is the Marriott, and the white one is the Tennessee. And they're the same buildings, but but painted black and white. And I don't know in 22 for whatever reason, uh, black and white. It's almost like Andy Warhol's famous black and white party. Uh, it's almost like that makes it modern to, uh, to make, have contrasting black and white uh, uh, buildings, but it kind, of, it kind of works in a way. Those look like new buildings today, but they were built uh, for the World's Fair. And uh, they're, they're uh, technically competing. Uh, they're, they're on the background of this, uh, this shot from the, uh, uh, the garden of the, of the KMA. Uh, they're technically competing hotels, the Tennessee and, and the uh, and the and the Marriott, but they uh, uh, but they're I think they're owned by the same group, so they they uh, they coordinated the coloring of, of the two buildings. But um, uh, next one, please. All right, here's the uh, the convention center uh, with the sun sphere in the background. The convention center, of course, was built in uh, in uh, in I think it was finished in 02, uh, uh, probably the biggest legacy of the uh, Victor Ash administration. Uh, massively, uh, more than $100 million was sent on, spent on the convention center. And uh, whether it was successful or not, either architecturally or as a convention center is, is up for grabs, but the, uh, uh, it's still used uh, uh, every, every week, if not every day for something. Uh, and here's the back. It's, it's hard to believe. So it's like a, a, a chameleon of a building because the back was completely different from, from the far end and, and the Henley Street side as well. It's like a uh, interesting Frankenstein sort of of a building, but this is the modernist side, and and I think this is probably the most uh, successful uh, architecturally part of of the building. Uh, but uh, the the side that you may not see unless you're actually on World's Fair Park uh, uh, itself. But it's had a few things. Andy's Roadshow has been there. They've got a, had a major bowling tournament once. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, that great uh, uh, inventors uh, thing that. Uh, 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 what the what do they call it for for students coming with inventions was they had a big convention there every year for many years they don't do it anymore but uh, but it's been a, it's, it's seen a lot of fun stuff and and and, and worthwhile stuff over the years certainly uh, but uh, but it was uh, uh, it's it's there and I guess the most conspicuous modern building on the 
on the World's Fair Park. Uh, next one, please. All right, here's the original court of flags that we saw briefly uh, a minute ago. And this is where uh, Ronald Reagan spoke and where a lot of, they had daily uh, 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 high school bands playing here uh, throughout the fair. It was kind of, uh, if you notice, it was kind of dysfunctional in some ways. It was a stage with uh, with kind of uh, uh, kind of risers on it uh, for for bands and orchestras. But look at where the audience should be. It was it was water. You know, you you you, you would have to it, you, the audience had to kind of crowd around the the waters of the world to uh, to uh, witness whatever was going on there. So it was not very functional. I remember the the night of the opening of the fair. Uh, they had a, a very well-known blues act, uh, 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 Sonny Terry and Brandon McGee. Brandon McGee, who was from Knoxville, were performing at uh, at the Quarter Flags, but nobody knew there was a performance space. So they were sitting on the Quarter Flags, and people were just walking all around them and walking by them. These two old old blues guys sitting on on a on a step, uh, playing while uh, while a few people thought they were buskers or something, and and started gathering around. And when I saw them, there were only about twenty people paying attention to this show and they, they had actually been here a year or two before at the uh, at UT uh, Alumni Memorial and had sold uh, you know five dollar tickets to uh, fill, fill the place uh, but but people didn't even know who they were or that this was a venue so it was never really very functional and it was kind of uh, reimagined uh, after that uh, what, what's the next one Paul uh, as as this, uh, the Court of Flags, by the way, had uh, flags of all 22 nations that were part of the World's Fair. And uh, Ross Fowler, uh, Mike Fowler with Ross Fowler, came up with this whole new idea of, of taking the theme of the Court of Flags and keeping all 22 flags, but doing something completely different with it. And they had uh, have two uh, circles of flags, 11 flags each, uh, with uh, this big, uh, massive fountain uh, feature in the middle. And I think it's been a very successful uh, thing. It's obviously a very popular thing. On hot day, there might be 150 kids playing in there with their uh, their parents uh, watching alongside. Uh, but this has been, a, I think, a, a use, more useful uh, way to interpret that idea. And might have been a good idea in 1982. But the landscape architecture of the fair is kind of what we're talking about now. The, the, how the, the landscape of World's Fair Park uh, has, uh, has kind of created a, 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 ver a very functional park, a better park than it had been had been before. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, here's another uh, feature of the uh, current uh, World's Fair Park uh, with the kind of faux uh, uh, creek down near uh, uh, Carmel Avenue. Uh, next one, a nice bridge over there. Okay, here's the uh, uh, East Tennessee Veterans Memorial. And this is the memorial that has the names of every soldier who died in combat in uh, in in war from East Tennessee since since 1917, uh, so they they have both world wars, Vietnam, Korea, uh, Iraq, uh, all, uh, Afghanistan, all these uh, these these uh, battles and soldiers are remembered here, and I think it's a great place for the war memorial because a lot of these guys saw the last of their hometown when they were here and might have gotten on a train at the LNN to go off to the basic training. In, uh, in 1917 or 19, 1942, uh, perhaps. But, uh, but the uh, has a, a bell tower in the middle, a modernist bell tower with uh, freedom of speech and has the four freedoms that uh, uh, President Roosevelt uh, uh, listed in, during World War II uh, that, that, that should be guaranteed. Uh, and that's, uh, it seems as relevant uh, in 2022 as, as any, any time in the last uh, century that this uh, memorializes. This has been here for about uh, uh, 12 or 14 years now. And they, uh, at more, more Memorial Day, they have veterans come here and they read all the names, the hundreds and hundreds of names, uh, thousands of names of soldiers who, were, who, were, who died in battle. Uh, read them out loud. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, here's the, uh, a shot of those hotels uh, and more kind of, and, stark relief there. Uh, th this is fairly new, this interesting contrast of white and black that we just thought we'd show another picture of that. And the uh, and they recently uh, painted bright uh, colors of the un underside of the old clinch viaduct. And again, these are the old 1905 piers for the original viaduct that are, that are there. And they, they uh, imitated the original uh, uh, design, kind of a, a floral design, uh, maybe dogwoody sort of design on the uh, outside of the of the uh, of the of the 
kind of the railings of the of the viaduct. Uh, next one, please. All right, here's uh, here's our last one, and uh, this is not architecture exactly, but certainly landscape architecture to put it there. This is a statue of uh, Sergei Romanov, uh, the, uh, the the famous Russian composer, and and probably the the uh, last really great classical composer that most people uh, would recognize uh, his tunes. Is uh, uh, Rachmaninoff uh, was this this uh, statue was a gift of a uh, of a, a Russian uh, 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 composer uh, named Viktor Bokharov, um, and the reason he gave it to Knoxville, uh, and he, they, it, I think, originally hoped it would be at UT campus uh, because uh, that was where Rachmaninoff gave the last performance of his career here in 1943, and this is called the the last concert, um, and um, and it's a, a beautiful, tall, oversized. It's probably 12 feet tall. This statue. Uh, but um, but it's a bronze statue. He sent over the plaster cast for it originally, and it stood uh, rarely seen by anybody, and in, in, except for a, a, a few friends, uh, a, an apartment building on on uh, on on Gay Street uh, in the stairwell of a, of, a, of, a, of a large condo actually on Gay Street um, uh, for about uh, ten years or so before it was finally bronzed and and. Uh, Oh, two. I think it's been there for about 20 years now, but I bet uh, I bet most Knoxvilleans have still never seen this. It's and kind of a quiet, secluded place. As it, I think it, it works there, except for the fact that uh, uh, very few people see it in a given hour. Uh, it's kind of you don't find it unless you're looking for it. Uh, but it, uh, if you haven't seen this, it's it's worth a it's worth a, a trip. But the World Sphere Park is, is it's a fascinating walk around. It's unlike uh, it, the combination of buildings there is unlike anywhere in the world. And I, I think I, I shouldn't have been so uh, surprised to think of uh, as I was riding along in the, in the, in the trolley to UT, uh, World Sphere Park, uh, Sun Sphere Candy Factory. And because it is a, it is kind of a charmed place, I think in a way in the, in the combinations of all these stories of all these buildings and, and landscape features that, that make it, uh, I think, unlike anywhere in the world. Uh, but uh, anyway, this is one of many things we're doing for uh, in celebration of the 40th anniversary of the of the World's Fair uh, this this uh, this uh, year. Uh, where exactly is it? If you know where the South Lawn is, it's right just south of the South Lawn. If you were to walk up from uh, from the corner of uh, Cumberland Avenue and 11th Street, just walk up the steps uh, into the uh, World's Fair Park there, you'll see it right away. It's kind of back behind some trees. Uh, I sometimes approach it from uh, walking uh, south of the uh, Tennessee Amphitheater toward UT and the bridge over Cumberland Avenue and, and uh, take groups and just turn right there into this copse of trees and, and there he is. Uh, but uh, but a really dramatic uh, spot. But uh, thanks a lot and, and, and come back uh, come back soon.